Hotel. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America Credit Union. Mountain America, guiding members forward for more than 80 years. Cougar Pregame Live is also brought to you by Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. And by Kingarf, Honda, Nissan, and Volkswagen in Orem. To get you ready for today's action, let's join the host of Cougar Pregame Live, Jason Shepard. Good morning, or maybe good afternoon, depending on wherever you are, BYU fans. Welcome into Cougar Pregame Live, presented by Mountain America Credit Union. Today, the eighth-ranked BYU Cougars face the Lions of North Alabama. My name is Jason Shepard. Thank you for tuning in. I'm in our BYU radio studios in beautiful Provo, Utah. Joining me from just down the road at Lavelle Edwards Stadium is former BYU quarterback and our radio analyst. And by the way, all-around good dude. His name is Riley Nelson. Riley, uh, BYU managed to get through its bye week and stay put in the top 10. They are number eight in both the AP and the coaches poll. Obviously, this upcoming week, we will find out exactly where they stand in the college football playoff rankings. But uh, we have other things to worry about before we get to that. With FCS North Alabama in town, BYU almost a 50-point favorite. I would not anticipate the Cougars picking up their first loss of the year, would you? No. In fact, this is a scenario where you're you're playing against the spread more than you're playing against your opponent because right. of the optics of all this and how tenuous a top 10 position can be so uh yeah that's uh obviously you got you got to respect every opponent and fear none but as far as it relates to the cougars and their prospects for postseason or even finishing out this season uh their real opponent today is the spread absolutely if all goes well as it should hopefully we'll be able to see some of the depth on display for the BYU Cougars. But we will worry about that once the game starts. And before the game starts, it's time to get to the things you need to know. Number one, eight and oh, BYU back after the bye week. It seems like forever, Riley, but Cougars' last victory was at Boise State on the 6th of November, the 55 17 dominating win on the Blue Turf. The Cougars' first ever against Boise in Boise. BYU, as we mentioned, stayed number eight in both the AP and the coaches poll. And after playing seven weeks in a row, a week to rest and heal came at a good time. The fact that BYU was even able to play seven weeks in a row is remarkable. We will see if the time off has helped guys like Lopini Katoa and Zane Anderson get back on the field today. But by all accounts, I I think it probably was a welcomed week off. Yeah, I mean, think about playing seven straight in COVID. That's all the more impressive. But think about playing seven straight in any season. Yeah. Uh, you normally try and place your bye week in there, uh, you know, between the start of the season, things like that. But, no, um, it, what you mentioned some players coming back. We hope to see, you know, Lupini and Zane. The reality is unless they've been good for like a last week and, ri- and chomping at the bit to play, you don't risk anything. That is the only negative here is that even though – the game is not necessarily going to be in question. Football is a violent sport no matter who you're lining up against, and there's bodies flying around everywhere. And so uh, two things. You don't want to risk a guy getting re-injured, and you want everybody to stay at attention um, so that you know there are no injuries arise. Well, and with the fact that at least currently – After this game, BYU does not play until the 12th of December when they host San Diego State. Now, obviously, that there could possibly be uh, opportunities for BYU to add a game. We don't know if they will, uh, but that certainly remains to be seen. So uh, if if guys are not ready to go, uh, you certainly, at least with the current schedule as it is, would have a few more weeks to get ready for that finale against the Aztecs. Uh, but that is a topic for uh, for another time on whether or not BYU will schedule another opponent. Number two is this is the first ever meeting with North Alabama, and it seems like, Riley, we've said that uh, most weeks against the teams that BYU has faced this season. They are an FCS opponent. In case you're wondering where North Alabama is located, they are in Florence, Alabama, which is in the northwest corner of the state. Their mascot is the Lions, and... I I don't know if you knew this, Riley. They have a live lion on campus. His name is Leo. He is the third Leo the Lion, and he he lives on campus. They essentially have a, a zoo on campus where their mascot lives, which you don't necessarily have very many live mascots these days. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I got it. 
first of all, I whoever I got to talk to, Jason, let me know because I'd like to petition that we get a live cougar somewhere on campus or at least maybe I'm one that's you. living up in the wild, but we've got a bunch of trail cams let's, and we can observe let's it. Let's just go find that one that, that, uh, that, <laughs> that chased that, that guy up Rock Canyon. Yeah. Like, no. he's, he's out, we know he's out there. But, hey, that's how they do it in the South. I remember when I was young, my grandparents were serving as mission presidents down in Louisiana, and we went down and we visited Louisiana State's campus. And at that time, this was in the mid-'90s, so I, I don't know if they still do it, but at that time they had a live tiger on campus, and we went. It definitely adds to the allure, and apparently that's how they do it in the South. Louisiana, <laughs> Alabama, Georgia, whatever, they keep those animals on campus. Uh, it might be something that we look into up here. Yeah, this is uh, this is a team that has really struggled, and it's been an, it's been a weird year for everybody. But uh, for, for a team like North Alabama, they're 0-3. And today will be their fourth and final game of the season. This is it for them. They were only uh, they only scheduled four games this year. So this is it. BYU, by the way, will be North Alabama's first ever ranked FBS opponent. And to say that they struggle mightily on offense would be an understatement. They're averaging 12 points per game. And the defense gives up 25. This is an offense that just is is not good. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's both, uh, meaning that personnel's not really there, uh, really at any place. It's not there up front. You, you normally with these teams, you you're like, oh, that dude's quick. Like we saw that against uh, um, Troy. Right, that wide receiver that mm-hmm. was he was like five eight, and you're like, man, this guy would probably would have been if he would have been five ten, he'd have been big time college football because he's got all the quicks and he's got all the speed. And that was, you know, obviously against his BYU defense, he took it like sixty plus and had over a hundred yards in that game. So normally you got one or two of these guys. Nor- Northern Alabama does not. Obviously they're not there up front. And then you look at them schematically and like they they struggle. I don't, I'm. I'm not necessarily, you know, sure on the background of the offensive coordinators or, or the guys calling the plays, but it looks like they might be new to the position. They're not really comfortable or have a real identity as a play caller. So from everywhere, from the game planning to play calling to the actual talent on the field, uh, they're obviously searching. Now, give some kudos to the defense because when you got an offense that is as anemic as this Northern Alabama offense is, and the defense still only gives up 25 points per game, that means those dudes stay in there. The, a lot of times when the offense is that bad, the defense is on the field for a long time uh they're facing short fields right and so they got to be really stout so this defense has been uh pretty admirable but you're right the offense has struggled as much as you know any that i've seen in, in recent memory we'll get to know more about the lions of north alabama when we come back we'll talk with their play-by-play broadcaster benjamin ray this is cougar pregame live presented by mountain america credit union on the new skin byu sports network This is Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Riley Nelson, here's Jason Shepard. The game's in the afternoon. I know making a lot of people happy. Lavelle Edwards Stadium, BYU hosting the Lions of North Alabama. Welcome back in to Cougar Pregame Live. Jason Shepard and Riley Nelson with you. It's time to get to know the foe. Happy to be joined by the play-by-play man for North Alabama. His name is Benjamin Ray. Benjamin, thanks for taking a few minutes. We really do appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate you guys having me on, and it's a lovely backdrop here. We're so excited to be here. Well, and uh, and this is a game that for BYU will be their ninth of the season. For the Lions, this is their fourth and final game. How have the players and coaches handled a season with only four games and with everything else that's uh, gone into it? I think these players and coaches deserve a lot of credit, you know, Everything shut down in March. North Alabama actually went all the way through spring training, but you miss all those summer workouts. We got guys back in July, and you had no clue what was going to happen. You're working out. What are you working out for? August rolls around. That's when the shutdowns start happening. I can't imagine being a player preparing for an 11-game schedule. Then you don't know what the schedule is. Then you find out it's four games. And the way North Alabama's done it, we've played one week, had a week off, played again. Then we had two weeks off. Then we played, then a week off. Now here we are again today. So the players have done such a good job adjusting. The the amount of focus they have had to have where where you get into a game week, coaches and players are creatures of habit. You get into that game week, you're ready, and then you're right back into a practice week. So their attention to detail, the way they've stayed locked in and balled in, they deserve major kudos. 
Benjamin, I uh, in the previous segment, Jason gave the listeners out there a little bit of feel for North Alabama. Obviously, not a program that many BYU fans are ultra familiar with. He talked about you know Florence and and Leo the Line and some of those things. Give us a sense for you know the heritage of this football program. Maybe have they had any notable pros or all Americans that uh, that really uh, add to the history, or are they such a young program that's kind of burst onto the scene that they're still trying to create that legacy? Yeah, so we're in the third year of our Division One transition. We were a Division Two program, and we were a Division Two power. Just to say, if if you go back to the nineteen ninety. And even the 80s, UNA is the second winningest football program in the state of Alabama behind Alabama. So that's ahead of Auburn, UAB, schools like that. So we have a rich football tradition in the 90s, three straight national championships at the Division II level. 2016, we played in the Division II national championship game in Kansas City and lost a Northwest Missouri State team. Then the transition began in 2018. So if you're a fan of Division II football, you know about North Alabama football. So Notable alumni, Harlan Hill was an NFL MVP in the 40s. I bet a lot of people don't know him. He was a tight end, uh, played for the Chicago Bears. Ronald McKinnon has probably been our most successful NFL player to date. He played 10 years in the NFL, I think nine years with the Cardinals, one year with the Saints. He was their leading tackler, one of the top tacklers in the NFL during his run. Look, let's also, Benjamin, not bury the lead here. George Lindsay, the actor who was Goober, in the Andy Griffith show and went on for Hee Haw is also an alum. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that, by the way. He is. Andy played football at North yes. Alabama. When you get into the weeds with it, there's a <laughs> lot of uh, crazy instances like that with the, the University of North Alabama. So now, look, everyone's aware of what the spread is. Everyone, you know, everybody in North Alabama is aware that BYU is the number eight team in the country. It's obviously a, a tall order for UNA. H- how do they look at a game like this? I think you look at a game like this as a great opportunity. We have a lot of guys, like most guys that play college football, that they feel like they're good enough to play at the next level. So if you want to get noticed, this is a great opportunity. Look at who you're playing. Look at who you're lining up against. If you think you're good enough to play at the next level, this is your game, your opportunity to get noticed on some game film. Benjamin, what game plan uh, from the preparation this week and press conferences and just being around the program – uh, for North Alabama to accomplish their goals, is there one thing they're trying? You know, Bill Belichick is famous for let's take away the one thing they're good at, or is it something that North Alabama wants to come out here and do, like establish the run, or we need to protect our passer? Coming into this game, if North Alabama can, you know, come out having checked one or two boxes, what would those one or two boxes be? I think. I'll- Offense, it starts with your playmaker weapons at wide receiver. UNA's got about four or five different guys that that have been great at the FCS level. So we have struggled to run the football this season, averaging just under 50 yards per game. And a lot of that has to do because of the tougher competition we've been playing. But the run game has been a weak point. So uh, for North Alabama to have success, you're going to have to spread the ball around, get creative, find ways to get it to those guys out in space. We talked about in the previous segment the fact that UNA's offense right now averaging 12 points per game. How much of that do you attribute to the fact that the number one quarterback coming into the season opted out and then both Deaver and Files have dealt with injuries? How much does that play into only averaging 12 points per game? I think it certainly plays into it. Uh, you know, you don't like to make excuses, but when you lose the guy that you thought would be the guy, the guy that really fits that RPO style type offense where he can run it, you you lose that. Then, then you go back. Liberty Blake Deaver got hurt. That was game one. He got hurt on the second drive of the game. We didn't see him again. Jacksonville State Rhett Files uh, did not play. He was in. No, I'm sorry. He played very little in that game. He missed the Southern Miss game. So they have both been in and out. The, the quarter back room is not quite what we expected but then you do have to keep in mind we are just four years removed from being a a division two program The, the juniors the seniors on this team this year the red shirt juniors and the seniors they were on una's last division two team and so that's not a knock on them but it is still a step up we've played two this will now be three fbs programs it's hard enough going division two to fcs but two we've played two pretty established fbs programs had a chance in one of them played liberty strong for a half they didn't have malik willis but 
Uh, I, I think we're very proud of the way that this team has played. We would have loved to have seen them play more FCS teams to, to maybe have a better measuring stick, but I, I feel like this team can hold their head up high with the way they've played. Benjamin, lastly, talk about this defense. Really impressed with the numbers they put up. You just mentioned undefeated Liberty held them to their season low. Southern Miss, second lowest point total. And uh, and Jacksonville State, I think they're either their lowest or second lowest point total of the season as well. How is this defense able to, when they're not getting much help from the offense, how are they able to still remain stout and not let games quite, quite honestly get out of hand? You know, it's tough for any defense when you're on the field continuously. We haven't allowed any points in the first quarter. Most of the scoring is coming in the second half. When you start tiring down when the offense isn't moving, it really starts up front on the defensive line. And this coaching staff, defensive depth was an issue the first year. So each each year we've gone through this transition, we've seen areas we needed to improve in. So we needed to go get some depth. So they go add a couple of transfers. Wallace Cowan Jr. from a, a Coastal Carolina, a Mike Boykin defensive tackle, started out at Louisville came to UNA from Tennessee State. Jabril Glaze, a Virginia Tech guy. So that they really beefed up this defensive line where all of a sudden we're 6'2", 250. We're looking more 6'4", 250 to 300 range. So it starts up front with the defensive line. And then we've got a couple of playmakers at linebacker who are your typical undersized linebackers that can really move around, make some plays. Christian Taylor, one of those, wasn't with the team last year, sat out. He's back this year. He's the leading tackler. The secondary, that there were a lot of question marks with this secondary. This was a secondary that they got hit with some opt-outs, some injuries, a couple of guys that ended up not being eligible due to some academic issues. So a couple of, and, and one player, unfortunately, that, that had to hang up football. So you lost about two or three guys that you thought would be starting, but it's a secondary for the most part that, that I think is overachieved. Benjamin Ray is the voice of North Alabama. You'll hear him on the broadcast for the Lions today. Benjamin, great insight. Thank you so much. Uh, Welcome to Provo, Utah, and have a great call today. Hey, we appreciate the time, guys. There we go. Benjamin Ray on the call for the Lions of North Alabama. All right, my one-on-one with defensive back Shimon Willis coming up a little bit later on at Shep Talk. But next, it's Cougar Cuts. You're listening to Cougar Pregame Live presented by Mountain America Credit Union on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're tuned to Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to your host, Jason Shepard. The undefeated and eighth-ranked BYU Cougars back at home today at Lavelle Edwards Stadium hosting the 0-3 North Alabama Lions out of the FCS. It's time for Cougar Cuts. And after eight games and seven straight weeks of action, BYU has had two weeks in between games. Offensive lineman Chandon Herring said that a bye week at the right time is always a welcome sight. Bye weeks, when they're well-timed like this, are appreciated. It's great to focus back on your own individual fundamentals and technique without the stress of prepping for a game that's coming up that week. And then, like Zach was saying, how we were able to focus on our strength and our speed and conditioning and continue to improve physically. So it was really good for a lot of guys and really good for me as well. You know, Riley, the bye week by itself is is a good thing, but you can certainly maximize it based off of when it happens. We talked about to begin the show. I, th- I think this came at a good time. I'm reminded, actually, if in the uh, National Football League, at the beginning of the year, you had the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Tennessee Titans that were supposed to play a game. I think it was week three. And because of COVID, they ended up having to postpone the game. And essentially, they were told, okay, well, this is your bye week. So they had week three was their bye week and now have to go through a 16-game schedule without another bye week. I, I, and that obviously is going to just be horrible for both of those teams. I, I think it came at a good time for BYU. This was, this was a, a really nicely timed um, break for this team, I think. Most definitely. And I think uh, the where the San Diego State, I, there wasn't much room to get the San Diego State game anywhere else, at least initially when Correct. they were trying to schedule it. So the fact that that was stuck on the 12th, had this North Alabama game happened, last week on the bye week and now you're looking three weeks so basically a month between games right a month real time between games 
the this just it gives you an opportunity to work on things. You guys don't quite let their guard down. If you're off for a month, guys might let their diet go a little bit. Maybe they're not as dialed in in practice. You know, you have more of a chance to let your guard down, but to have a bye week play and then two weeks with the hope sitting out there that like we might get a game on a couple days notice. I don't want to foster too much hope. I'm not saying I have any inside info on anything like that, but there's been enough talk, that, and we know that Homo's working uh, out there to get a game. I think it keeps this team sharp. It keeps them ready. It keeps them prepared, whereas had the bye week come at any other time, we'd be sitting at a, at a tremendous rest that honestly would have me a little bit worried to face San Diego State on the 12th, but the, with the way that this has worked out, it's worked out for both the rest and development of the team, but also keeping the guys mentally engaged and working on their skills. The Cougars' offensive performance has been remarkable from the get-go. It's it's obviously been on display. Everybody's paying attention to it. BYU top 10 in total offense, scoring offense, passing, and completion percentage. And I asked Chandon Herring how nice it's been to actually have the eyes of college football paying attention to the BYU offense. It's nice to see the improvement that our team has made. Um, it's great to see that we are playing well and that's being recognized. But it also is, like Zach said, we're not done yet. And so when the season is, you know, wrapped up, finished, there's a little bow on it is when you can sit back and be like, man, that was a really awesome year, great season. But in the midst of it, if you get satisfied, that's when you're vulnerable and you can lose it. Um, And the first people to praise you are sometimes the first people to criticize you. And so you take everything with a grain of salt. You know, I completely understand why the players and coaches, you know, talk uh, like that in terms of not getting satisfied. I mean, that's a, that's exactly the way you should be handling it. But there there has to be there are there has to be a a a certain amount of pride to know what you are accomplishing on offense and that where you rank and that college football is paying attention to you. And from a recruiting standpoint, that this is a really really big deal. So while I understand why Chandon said what he did, and he's 100% right, there, there are a lot of positives coming out of what this offense is doing. Yeah, and I think I, what I like most about what Chan, what's most true about Chandon is the people who are the first to, to praise you are going to be the ones that are just can't wait to step on right. you, right? Like, like he probably doesn't listen to our show, but like the Skip Baylesses of the world or the Colin Cowards, right, these like rock jock guys that are just trying to spin whatever they can to get controversy and social media clicks, like you don't want to be fodder for those guys, right? Now, right. there's a lot of genuine love out there for BYU. I hear I'm going on a little bit of a riff on national radio guys. Like Jim Rome, I think, is a genuine supporter and a guy who's level-headed and not looking for stuff like that. But you just don't want to be in those guys' conversation to give them any opportunity to turn. But what, wherever it exists on the spectrum, from you use the word pride there could be the word confidence self-assurance as i think is one or self-assertiveness you can't create a false you can't be like man anybody can beat us on any day it's like no like north alabama can't score like they can't score more than 20 points against teams <laughs> that are far inferior to us so let's not create this false narrative because that people can and especially football teams like you have to be genuine and the second that you start becoming disingenuous it it the motivator becomes false and that's what actually it's actually that disingenuousness that undermines your team's performance rather than any other external motive factor so come in be assured be self-assured be confident be proud of what you've done and take that approach to doing like this is who we are and this is how we play and we expect that to happen this saturday rather than trying to create this thing like everybody should be looking over their shoulder when we all know there's no valid reason to do that Coming up next, I go one-on-one with Shimon Willis in Shep Talk. More Cougar pregame live presented by Mountain America Credit Union coming up after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're tuned to Cougar pregame live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to your host, Jason Shepard. Inching closer to kickoff from Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Jason Shepard with you, getting you ready for the Cougars and the Lions. It's time for Shep Talk, and Shimon Willis grew up around BYU with his dad being the great running back Jamal Willis. He always wanted to play at BYU, but that opportunity took a little while to happen. I get into that with Shimon, among other things, for this week's Shep Talk, and I asked Shimon how he and his teammates handled the week off due to the bye. I wouldn't say we had a week off, uh, at least 
for me, I kind of just try to keep my mindset still on the season and obviously still on just like getting better and improving on my things that I need to do in order to help the team. So, I mean, it could be, it could look at like at the outside world as we had a bye as a bye week and a week off, but I think most of the guys and a lot of us were kind of taking it as another work week, another week to get better and then just prepare for obviously Northern Alabama and the rest of our season. So having played eight games, including seven weeks in a row, did the bye week come at a good time? Was it a needed bye week? I think so. I think it was one of those things that if we didn't have a bye week, we would have made it work and we would have um, just kept going and kept, um, kept doing what we needed to do. But I think as a whole group, as a program, I think it was good for us to kind of just, okay, now look at those games that we play, see what we can do better, and then just have that extra preparation time to kind of take in and, and get those uh, things fixed and, and going into this next game. Well, since you're in evaluation mode, how would you evaluate the defense through eight games? Uh, I think we're playing very well. I think we're doing a lot of things that uh, we've been harping on ever since fall camp, and I think we're doing them very well. I think Obviously, as I'm sure a lot of guys will say, there's always room to improve and there's always things to uh, get better at. And I think uh, one thing we've harped on is as a team is that we don't think we've played our best game yet. And I think that's kind of surprising to a lot of people. But from us as a program, we know we have more in the tank. We know we have um, more to give. And I think um, we should be able to uh, do that this year. So hopefully we get the get the chance to do that. So. Shimon, if opponents are hearing that and they're saying, wait a minute, they haven't played their best game yet, that's pretty scary if you think about it. So we looked at the defense as a whole. How about evaluating yourself? How has the season gone for you, do you think? I think it's been good. I, I mean, I started uh, the season off at nickel and then just personnel things. I'm, I moved over to a uh, corner. And so I think I've been able to kind of um, balance both positions and kind of just uh, figure that out. But I think um, as a whole, I've been able to grow just as a football player. This is only my second year of of a full college football season so I think I've learned a lot and I was able to um, use what I learned last year to carry over this year so it, I, I definitely have learned a lot and grown as a football player this year. Your journey to BYU it, it didn't start at BYU it obviously started at Weber State when you look at your journey to BYU how would you describe what it took to get to this point for you? That's one of the things I kind of think back as I'm like here and just think wow like it kind of sometimes just shocks me that I, I was able to make it here obviously growing up uh, my dad played here and I just, he worked here. So I grew up around this program and it was my dream ever since I was a little kid to just play here and, and be able to contribute to this team. And so out of high school, it was tough not getting the opportunity and how to go a different route, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. My opportunity prepared me for like being able to be at BYU and be able to do the things I do. And it's, and it's, it's just helped me learn so many things, not only in football, but outside of football. So I wouldn't change it for the world. With your dad having the career he had here, and obviously in the NFL as well, I read a quote uh, from a, uh, an article, I think is maybe even a year, year and a half ago, and you're talking about how he's been influencing you since you were in diapers. I mean, he's always been an influence for you. In what ways has he helped you most? I feel like me and my dad have uh, different kind of football paths, as probably a lot of people can tell. We play different positions, both different sides of the ball. But I think just one thing that he kind of uh, has always harped to me is just control what I can control and I think there's so much about the game that we just can't control and is out of our hands and I think he's always harped on making sure that you can control the things that you can control and make sure you're doing the doing the things that you can control and then just let everything else um, work out as it may because he always tells me football is just a crazy sport and one day this could happen and the next day it could just a 180 so as long as you're just controlling your controllables then you're going to be you're going to put yourself in the right position to be successful so I think that's the biggest thing that he's had an influence on me. Shimon staying with that same topic in terms of controlling all you can control you can't control how people view this matchup with UNA I mean you guys are almost a 50 point favorite in this all you guys can do is get ready to play a football game on Saturday you guys have been able to do that this entire year being able to kind of put the noise behind you how much do you think your success as a team has come from your ability to do that and focus on the task at hand? I think it has a lot to do with that. I think our coaches, especially Kalani, um, has kind of harped on focusing on the next on the next task at hand, not looking forward to what's to come or looking back at what we've already done. It's just looking at what we're what, what's right in front of us. And I think that's kind of been our motto for our whole team is we know we're winning games and, and we know what we have goal-wise as a season, but we can't do those things if we're 
if we're skipping steps and we kind of just focus on the task at hand, the practice at hand and the game at hand that week. So I think that's helped us a lot. All right, let's put the football stuff behind us. Let's get to the final four. If you could have a Zoom conversation with anyone, who would it be? <laughs> Probably have to be Deion Sanders. I'm kind of biased with corners and stuff. So I would, I would have a lot to kind of pick his brain about. So I think that would be an entertaining uh, Zoom call for me. Have you ever had any interaction with Dion at all? Uh, it's funny. Um, so when my dad went to went to the 49ers, it was right when he joined the team that Deion Sanders had uh, either got traded or something like that. He was there uh, when Dion was kind of cleaning his locker room and stuff like that. So he was actually he uh, I don't know if Dion knows this and he'll ever find out, but he left like a little glove behind and uh, my dad ended up picking it up and keeping it. He still has it to this day. And so I kind of just always thought that was so cool. But that's really cool. That's that's not bad at all. What is your cheat day snack meal or dessert? I'm probably a wing guy. I, I like chicken wings. That's the, I think that's my uh, that's my go to. Okay, so now this is an important question with that. This is this is the natural follow up to that. So <laughs> we talk about chicken wings. We talking with the bone or are you going with the boneless? No, I got to go bone. I got to go bone for sure. Okay. Bone. It's always at this point of the interview, I start to get really, really hungry when we start talking about food. So uh, what sport would you play if you didn't play football? Oh, for sure. Basketball. Uh, I grew up, that was my second sport all the way till probably like my sophomore year here at high school. And that was when I really wanted to take football to the next level. But basketball was my dream and played a year around. Uh, I love basketball. And I just love the fact that you could go out by yourself and just play basketball. So it would definitely be basketball for sure. All right. Last question. What makes the 2020 BYU football team special? Uh, I think it's just the brotherhood that we have. I mean, I've only been a, a member of, this would be my second team, uh, BYU team or BYU year, but I just think we're so much closer as a team. It's weird because we haven't been able to get out and do really a lot of team activities because of COVID and things like that. But just at practice, just in film room and team meetings in the locker room, I think just the overall brotherhood and coming together and kind of just being close knit has really been something special, I think. And I think that's really driven the success that we've had so far. Shimon, great job. Appreciate it. And good luck against North Alabama. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it so much for having me. Cougar defensive back Shimon Willis. Appreciate him taking a few minutes this week for Shep Talk. Coming up next, it's the QB Read with Riley. You're tuned into Cougar Pregame Live presented by Mountain America Credit Union on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. We- This is Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Riley Nelson, here's Jason Shepard. Welcome back to Cougar Pregame Live, presented by Mountain America Credit Union. Reward yourself with my style checking from Mountain America. Earn points toward travel, gift cards, events, and more. Details at macu.com slash mystyle. Membership required based on eligibility. It's time for the QB Read with Riley. Riley, you dog. (laughs) And as much as he would probably like to talk about Gordon Hayward signing with the Charlotte Hornets for $120 million, that is not what today's QB read with Riley is about. Thanksgiving is next week. It's a time for everybody to reflect on what's important. I have a feeling that giving thanks may be a primary focus for you today, Riley. Am I right? Yeah, Jason. I mean, I I normally like to be strict. Find a strategic or a game plan or something, you know, some position group or something to take an angle on. I, I really felt like I would have been forcing the issue with something with this week. So, so instead, I'm taking the opportunity because I'm not very active on social media. I have some accounts, but you know, I, I'm just not great. I'm not a power user like you and Greg and some of you other guys. So, and, and I know the Russell M. Nelson video made its rounds in, in a lot of BYU circles out there, and there was a challenge to give thanks. So, this is the medium that I have and uh, to give thanks and um, it's and so what I'd like to give thanks about in this week of Thanksgiving that's coming up on Thursday is a few things first of all is the game of football at the game of football and I know that sounds silly but uh, I know there's a lot of people out there listening that have participated in it to some level maybe uh, maybe they haven't had the chance to play maybe there was health issues maybe they got injured maybe just you know it wasn't in the cards for them to play but they've been lifelong fans and they have a tremendous passion for the sport I love the game of football because it is the ultimate microcosm for life for me there are so many lessons that I have learned from it that have been of such use utility and benefit to me throughout my life 
things like teamwork, the nature that it is both a mentally taxing game and a physically taxing game. Life is mentally taxing and physically taxing. If you've ever had to work a manual labor job for, you know, um, the, just the, the willpower to get up every day and go and give good effort, and even when you're physically taxed or mentally tired, right, there's, there's those kind of parallels. There's teamwork. None of us can live our lives in isolation, whether it's working as a team with your family, whether it's working as a team in your office, whether it's working with a team with, you know, in your your church or whatever it is you learn those lessons with football you learn how to get along with people from different backgrounds you learn how to respect everybody regardless of you know where they came from all that really matters is are we aligned towards a common goal and everybody working towards achieving that so absolutely love the game of football and i'm thankful for it second thing uh, i'm thankful for as part of qb read this week is byu this institution uh changed the course uh, of my life uh, kind of just your average kid from Logan you know rural Utah up in Logan there had been a couple of guys that had left and played some big time football um, but but none at a position like quarterback and uh, I'm so grateful for BYU as the university and then also the coaching staff to take a chance on a guy like me and then the fact that uh, I consider myself lucky enough to actually have had uh, meaningful to have played here and been able to contribute even in a very small part um, to this storied program and the legacy of BYU football. Like I said, it's changed my, my life forever. And part of that, not just the program, not just the coaches, not just the, the, the uh, network of alumni, not just the opportunity that I get to be with you guys here on the radio crew, but also the fans. It really the how they have embraced me i was a guy that was a little bit i i found myself in a time where there was quite a bit of controversy and there were play, games i played great and games i didn't play great and i know that affects the emotion of fans but how B, how cougar nation or the byu fan base embraced me during my time here have continued to do so after those are and i know a lot of people think like because we don't know each other we do if you were a fan and you watched me play and we talk about a specific game or a specific time like that is a that is a true connection uh there that i, I am extremely grateful for and is a huge part of why i feel so uh indebted and will forever be uh, uh tied to byu football and then lastly just grateful for family both my football family uh ex-teammates coaches colleagues everyone who I, we've been able to uh, foster those or, or forge those really close relationships with and then my actual family both my parents who raised me my siblings and and uh, how they supported me throughout my time and then now my wife and my boys who uh, you know allow me to do fun things like this which is scratch the itch of of, uh, of co- that I still have you know it's bad enough that I'm like all in on Maction football on Tuesday right <laughs> <laughs> and, and my wife puts up with that but then also to spend you know most of my Saturdays here with you and Greg and the crew which I absolutely love that's a sacrifice that she makes so I'm grateful to her and then I uh, can't wait for my boys to get a little bit bigger and tag them along with me so uh, to grateful for all three of those things football BYU football specifically and, the, and then the university as a whole and then the family that comes along with that yeah Riley it is it's the time of year where we are we all start to reflect and we start to take um, take stock of what's important to us and I mean this always happens we always say we need to do it year round but we don't always do it year round and but this time of year it's something that's always um, important for all of us to do and a lot of the things that you mentioned, you know, look, this I I absolutely love my job. I mean, this is this is the career that I always wanted, and so to have it, I'm extremely grateful. But there there are so many things to be grateful for if you're a BYU fan this year about this team specifically. Eighth ranked in the country, an opportunity possibly to go to a New Year's Six if everything were to fall in place. You know, maybe a college football playoff. You don't, don't need to get into, maybe you know, how realistic that may be. But there are so many things with this team right now for fans to be grateful for. This has been an unbelievable year that, that at least from the outside looking in, when this schedule was put in front of us, none of us expected. You could not have put that better, Jason. And let me preface this because I know being grateful is not – a function of comparison it's not comparing yourself but to me it helps me sometimes realize when you look around at other college programs who can't even get a game together 
or or lost their opportunity to play at all and we as BYU football fans and supporters are enjoying the season that we've had now boy oh boy count your blessings absolutely all right we're gonna take a quick break when we come back we will visit with the voice greg rubel cougar pregame live presented by mountain america credit union continues right after this on the new skin byu sports network Let's get you back to Jason Shepard and Riley Nelson for more Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Number eight, BYU and the Lions of North Alabama getting ready to kick off at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. We'll have it for you right here on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Jason Shepard with you in our BYU radio studios. Joining me from Lavelle Edwards Stadium, Riley Nelson. You will hear him on the call with the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, who also joins us now speaking of things we are thankful for greg we're thankful that you're the voice of the cougars and i'm thankful that you are in our byu radio studios <laughs> as our ever capable host and uh we're a team and it's great to be part of this team absolutely and i just noticed uh, a few minutes ago uh your booth bits which are always tasty mm. um again made with the uh, bits of real booth r- real real booth which yeah. is important um Running back Lopini Katoa does not appear to be available today among some others. Zane Anderson looks like he is available. What else can you tell us about the availability of some of the Cougars today? Well, I, I hit the high points on the tweet, and um, and, and you mentioned them there. Lopini, uh, pretty nasty injury against Boise State, and I think right now the objective is to get him ready for the next game, whenever that game is going to be. If that's December 12th, so be it. But uh, Lopini... Uh, not not expected to play today, but Zane is. And Zane had a pretty nasty injury, too, the game before Boise State, missed Boise State, and warmed up. I'm not sure that Zane would, would need to play a lot today. And Kalani told me he's not 100%, but he's enough to play and, and play effectively. But they'll be you know managing his snaps, certainly. And uh, and that's good news. So you, you, want, you want to make sure that you head down the stretch run with as much health as possible amongst your key players, and Zane certainly is one of those. Uh, D-line depth a little down with Al Bakri and Batty missing today, but uh, they're going to be just fine. Uh, that, that's a really solid group, and and uh, and they'll be asked to handle a UNA run game that isn't doing much, as you heard from Benjamin Ray and talked about already. That's a, that's a team averaging fewer than 50 yards per game on the ground, and now you're taking on one of the best rush defenses in the FBS. And so BYU should be adequately equipped, even down a couple of guys on the D-line. Uh, you may see Braden Keim play today on the O-line uh, because uh, Joe Tukawap who's not available. So you're likely looking at the same group across the front with Christensen, Barrington, MP, Hodge, and Herring. But that number two group will likely be composed of Lachance, Longson, Pei, Keim now, and, and Blake Freeland. And again, this is a group that just continues to get stronger and better, I think, as the season goes along. A real bright spot for BYU has been the play of the offensive line. Uh, wide receiver depth, a uh, bit of a hit. Uh, Keanu Hill not available again. Second straight game uh, that he will miss. But uh, the backups to the big three, the big three being Pau, Milne, and Romney, the backups to the big three would be Epps, Cosper, and Jackson today in all likelihood. Greg, do you... Oh, re- sorry. And, oh. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Riley, no, forget the interruption. I was just going to tag on one last thing. Uh, we could see uh, up to four quarterbacks today. Uh, you're going to see Zach Wilson, Baylor Romney, Soljay Mayava-Peters, and Jacob Conover may indeed wow. uh, be in the mix as well today. At least that's my suspicion. And, they, and they're probably going to address a fifth quarterback in Rhett Riley as well. So whether or not he gets in the game, I think they're going to put a put a jersey on him today and 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 have him available. But uh, yeah, I mean, and, you know, in, in the, it's a free year anyway, right? right? Um, so no matter how many games you play or don't play, you can get the year back. And so there's really no concern about players. Oh, they got in the game. And plus, we already know about the four game redshirt rule. So there's a lot of reasons to play some guys that might not might not otherwise play in other games this year, Shep. Yeah, it's uh, as a former quarter. Those first reps are nerve wracking. I don't care who you are. So if you can get the, but even if you get your first reps, you know, whether it's Jacob Conover or whatever in a free year, you get those first reps in this game when you are called on later and perhaps a potential big spot, you've already got that behind you. So you don't have to worry about turning the wrong way on a handoff, which I've seen way too many times <laughs> over the years. Hey, Greg, I was just going to ask, have you seen a team, because we're talking about seeing depth, but these are names that I feel like we've called out before. Do you remember a team in recent memory? We're going to get into the second and thirds, but these are going to be names we've we've called. Like, I, 
what comes to mind is Caleb Christensen, right? He was kind of just the kickoff return guy. He's a freshman from up in northern Utah. And then all of a sudden comes up with a pick in the second quarter in a big spot against Boise. Uh, have you seen a team mix their depth as good as – or can you recall a team that's mixed their depth as good as this BYU team has this year? Yeah, it's it's one of the better that way, Riley. And, and you even talk – you know, corner doesn't get a ton of attention on this team. Uh, I don't know that BYU's faced a real – um, you know, throwing juggernaut yet. Boise comes closest, but they were, you know, down on their own depth. Maybe their pass game wasn't where it needed to be necessarily. But uh, you, you, when, when you say Ellison, Wilcox, and Harper, and Heron, and Mandel, that's a pretty good group of five to handle two spots for you right now. And, and all those guys have played this year, right? Um, George Udo was somebody who didn't, didn't get a ton of pub coming in. He's made big plays along with Caleb at that spot. Troy Warner's kind of locked things down uh, at one safety spot. If there was one area we saw that might need some attention, and that was uh, that, that was the, Ander- the absence of Zane Anderson. There was probably something to work on there, and I think what you've seen in the last two weeks for BYU is different guys getting reps at that spot. Now, Zane, as I said, is expected to play today, but let's keep an eye on who, who replaces him today because that's really going to try and, I, I think, build a little bit of depth. I'm not sure they were terribly happy with how that position was played in its entirety against Boise State, and so Malik Moore, I, I, I think, is a guy that's going to see reps there. You might even see... Uh, a little crossover. Don't be surprised if you see an unusual number playing in the secondary. If this game, if this game gets late, say fourth quarter, and they want to throw some reps out there, um, Chris Jackson's a guy. Then, in addition to being a good wide receiver, uh, has taken a couple snaps at safety as well. So maybe something to look at there as they try and find depth behind Zane. But it'll be good to see Zane back, and, and the hope is you just keep him healthy for however many snaps he plays today and get him ready for that next, that next game whenever it comes because he's still trying to work his way back uh, to full health. So I'm going to call a little bit of an audible because I plan. Uh, this is this is a, a little bit of a preview for something that I want to talk a, about more in depth with Mitchell Jurgens coming up in a few minutes. But I'm very curious to get both of your opinions on this. Isaac Rex is quietly having one heck of a season. How good has Isaac Rex been this year? Well. He's good enough that only one other tight end in college football has more touchdown catches. <laughs> and he's good enough that only one freshman in college football has more touchdown catches coming into today than, than Isaac Rex. And so it was a natural concern when you lose Matt Bushman as to how that, um, you know, how that position is going to look this year. But Isaac, and not just Isaac, but Isaac and, and his teammates – have done an amazing job at, at making sure that wasn't a, a critical loss for BYU. It's been tremendous. And 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 I, I want to look at Matt Bushman's freshman stats because we all know Matt was good from the get-go, right? Well, Matt, as a freshman, pulled in he had 49 balls. So 49 catches for Matt as a freshman. Now, Isaac's not going to get there. He's at 21. Uh, of of uh, Matt's 49 catches as a freshman, three were for touchdowns of Isaac's 21 as a fr- as a freshman six are for touchdowns yeah. he has a higher yards per carry as a or rather a higher yards per reception uh, than Matt did as a freshman and again Matt was good from the get-go and yep. so we, we're seeing Isaac do similar if you know similar stuff to Matt Bushman who, who, who you know who was going to be an All-American this year we have every confidence had he played he would have been that so you're looking at a special talent and and Isaac could be you know the next Matt right the next Matt Bushman I think he's that good, and, um, and we're, we're seeing not necessarily just the tip of the iceberg, but we're seeing how, how, Im, how impactful his plays can be with that touchdown catch to reception ratio right now, which is crazy. When they get to the red zone, that's a prime target right now. Uh, well, you know, one, one, two of the most effective plays for BYU in the red zone right now are Zach Wilson taking off and Isaac Rex in the end zone. Yeah. That's worked out really well for BYU. Yeah, I mean, in Riley, I mean, as Greg mentioned, the fact that he's doing this as a freshman, man, alive. The the the, the thought about what he could do over the course of his career is extremely exciting. So I. Prior to Matt Bushman, and by the way, Matt Bushman, I think you mentioned how many catches he had, Greg, and all that. He, he was. There was some dark. I, I wouldn't. Say, I wouldn't say dark, but like he was like the lone bright spotter. He was the guy that was that 2017. Years, that yeah, was 2017. It was like, yeah. dude, he's our yeah. only player. So it was great job on him to carry carry us, really carry the team, carry the fan base, carry everybody through that, through some offensive struggling, uh, some offensive struggles. I liken Rex's. I see the, 
and and hopefully because this would be great for BYU it would be great for him and I don't want to put added pressure comparing him to this guy that I'm going to compare him to but I see his career arc being somewhat similar to Dennis Pitta's Dennis really emerged as a senior what happened from his junior to senior year was you know it Collie was that 2008 year Collie was the guy right he was getting fed he had all the touchdowns but Dennis was still he was that red zone guy he had a bunch of touchdowns but he didn't have the volume and then once Collie left, he became Max's security blanket. Now he was catching balls all over the field, not just in the red zone or on third downs. I see Isaac as being that he's filling his position that in those critical areas, and not so much on third down because they don't throw to, go to the tight ends that much on third down, but definitely in the red zone. And then as guys like Gunner and Dax potentially move on, he becomes someone who be you know is used all over the field all the time he's definitely got the natural pass catching ability I think he does a good job in the run game I I, I honestly now that we're discussing him I want to uh, put on the tape and see I he definitely hasn't been a weakness in the run game I wonder if he's as dominant in the run game but as a pass natural pass catcher the dude is is amazing and he is so young um i I hope he can develop and flourish into you know a guy like dennis pitt and if he does that's going to work out pretty well for him as dennis ended up getting drafted winning a super bowl ring and uh, having a pretty good NFL career before injuries cut it short. Absolutely. As I mentioned, you're going to have more of an in-depth conversation uh, with Mitchell Juergens coming up uh, in just a second about Isaac Rex, but I I wanted to get both of your take uh, on on just a fantastic season for him so far. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, Great stuff. We'll uh, give you a little bit of a break, and we'll hear you again in about 30 minutes. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Thanks, guys. It's Greg Rubel and Riley Nelson. We will talk with Mitchell Juergens coming up right after a legal ID. So we will pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is BYU Football. Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're tuned to Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to your host, Jason Shepard. Getting you ready for number eight BYU and the O and three UNA Lions of North Alabama. Welcome back into Cougar Pregame Live. Jason Shepard with you in our BYU radio studios in Provo, Utah. Joining me from Laval Edwards Stadium is Mitchell Jurgens, our sideline reporter, former BYU receiver. Mitchell, you, uh, my friend, have been blessed with a fantastic day to be out and about uh, near the end of November, my friend. Yeah, no, I honestly couldn't ask for for a better day of football, <laughs> um, especially this, you know, Texas roots guy that just freezes his butt off every time he steps on the field, not moving around in, in football pads. So, um, yeah, definitely I, I, I'd love to see the sun out, no clouds. So it's, it's going to be a glorious day. All right, we're going to get into Isaac Rex coming up in just a second. But after a massive win at Boise and then a bye week, what is it you want to see from BYU today? Yeah, first off, I want to see them pick up right where they left off. Um, you know, they, they played some incredible football, especially in that second half against Boise State. Um, you know, the, and, and when you view this game, it's this is not a scrimmage, right? This is this is an actual football game, um, and, and they should always view it that way. You, you can't treat it like a, you also can't treat it like a guaranteed win uh, because players won't be as sharp. You know, they never are when they feel like they, they don't have to be as dialed in. Um, and, and so they just got to pick up where they left off. This is an opportunity to prove themselves uh, from an offensive standpoint, um, you know, move the ball consistently. Uh, we want to see, you know, I, I think it was a couple weeks ago here at home um, that they came out and scored every single drive in the first half. And, and that's what you want to see, um, that consistency in moving the ball, converting on third down if it gets to that. Um, and then from a defensive standpoint, get North Alabama off the field. No more 10-minute drives uh, from opposing teams. Uh, I mean, it, it's an opportunity for the defense to really just buckle down on third downs, come up with some big stops, get the ball back in Zach Wilson's hand. Uh, that, that's really what I want to see tonight well, or today. And, and based off of what we've seen from the Lions offense, I'm not sure that that's going to be possible anyway. Right. Uh, look, they're, they're, they're struggling, and there's a lot of different reasons why they're struggling. Uh, but th- this is a game. Look, BYU's a 50 point, well, 49, I think, technically. They're, they're an almost 50 point favorite for a reason. This is, this is one of those games where, you know, BYU should be able to roll. Uh, all right, so I mentioned it, talked with Greg and Riley a second ago about Isaac Rex. Look, BYU's offense has so many playmakers, but I honestly don't think Isaac Rex is getting talked about enough. 
His six touchdowns are tied for the most receiving touchdowns on the team. And to put his six TDs so far in perspective, Matt Bushman, who we know is great, had nine TDs in three seasons. This guy right now is putting up some unbelievable numbers as a freshman. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he has, he's been so good. Um, and But to be honest, I mean, it, it, it's been a nice surprise, right, to see him come in. I mean, after the loss of Matt Bushman, there was some serious heartbreak uh, for Matt, I mean, for BYU fans in general, thinking, you know, what, what else could go wrong here in 2020? Um, but it, honestly, it shouldn't be much of a surprise. If you go back to fall camp last year, Isaac Rex was turning heads. Um, he, he had such an incredible fall camp. Obviously, you know, lost him due to injury, so we didn't get to see him last season. Um, but this, I mean, this isn't anything new. This guy has always been a fabulous player who, who I was excited about. Um, and, and just to kind of, uh, I mean, the guy's a, the guy's a physical specimen as well. Um, couple, couple, you know, big names out there, right? Johnny Harleen, Dennis Pitta, um, both 6'4", listed at 238. Isaac Rex listed at 6'6", 247, almost 250 pounds, and that guy can move. I mean, this is a big target. Um, we've seen it, right? He, he's got a great feel for, um, you know, as a tight end to be, you know, one of the best tight ends in the game. You've got to have a good feel for zone coverage, um, finding holes, and he has that feel as a freshman. I mean, it, it's just incredible the things that he's doing. We've seen him in one-on-one coverage. They obviously trust him and like him. Um, to, to go up and, and catch the ball on those one-on-one matchups, um, expecting that you know he is going to out jump and outreach these players, and so I mean he just brings such a, a an awesome weapon to the BYU offense. That true, I mean we talk a lot about Dax and Gunner and Zach, and, um, and and as Isaac deserves more love because he has been just a steady playmaker, um, so reliable for for Zach Wilson's offense. Look, we don't know what's on the horizon with BYU's schedule. There's a very real chance that today's game is the second-to-last regular season game for BYU, and there's been a lot to be impressed by, and BYU deserving of every bit of attention they're getting, both locally and nationally. When you look at what this team has been able to do and the, the individual performances, the performances that they've done as a collective, what aspect of this team has impressed you most? And then is there is there a specific player that, that maybe stands out for you? Yeah, so, I mean, from a team perspective, um, just the, the 45.2 points per game, um, average scoring, and then 13.9 points against. Uh, that I mean, that's incredible. It's a 31.3 point spread. And if you would have told me before the season that that's what we would have seen, I would have been like, wait, are you serious? Uh, I mean, I, I didn't know BYU was this good. I mean, we've, we've seen them, you know, the, the kind of classic – um, obviously, their schedule wasn't as um, intense as it would have been, but we've seen games in you know in, in previous matchups where BYU was the clear favorite, and they kind of just drop their level of competitiveness to to play um, to you know not play to their best of ability, and, and there's closer games, and so that gap has been so impressive from. Um, just to see the how, how well they're doing from both offense, defense, special teams. Um, so that's the biggest thing. As far as players go, um, I can't just limit it to one. I've got to say two, Dax Milne and Tyler Algier. Um, coming into the season, you know, Dax, he, Gunner was the go-to guy, and, and, and Gunner has been nothing short of amazing. He's had an incredible year. Um, but what Dax has been able to do from an overall receiver standpoint, um, his routes, his, the connections, he doesn't drop balls. Um, he has been so amazing and I personally believe I think he's the best receiver that BYU has. Um, so, so so impressive for him. And then Tyler, um, uh, in preseason there was some uh, you know concerns about the running back position, and uh, wondering if Tyler you know is he a running back? Is he a linebacker? If he is an every down running back, I mean, can he really fill that role? How we've seen BYU great running backs do it in the past. And honestly, I can say this is one of my favorite players to watch week after week. He's strong, he's tough, he's fast, and uh, just love what he's doing this year. Mitchell, great stuff as always. It's always fun to talk with you. Enjoy the sunshine and the cooler but not cold temperatures today. Uh, this uh, should be a fun one. Appreciate the time. Thanks, hey, man. Yeah, thanks so much, Jason. There we go. That's Mitchell Jurgens. You'll hear him on the broadcast, roaming the sidelines with Greg and Riley. On the other side, you're going to hear from North Alabama head coach Chris Willis. That's next on Cougar Pregame Live, presented by Mountain America Credit Union on the new skin, BYU Sports Network.
You're tuned to Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to your host, Jason Shepard. We're getting you ready for BYU in North Alabama. Earlier this week, I talked with the head coach of the Lions, Chris Willis, and it actually just dawned on me that both of my interviews this week are with guys whose last name is Willis. It was certainly not planned that way, and to be honest with you, I'm probably the only one that finds that interesting, but it just uh, hit me as I said that. Coach Willis has been a college football coach since 1999, and all but three of those seasons have been at UNA. We continue our interview series with coaches with Southern accents, and I couldn't be happier. Here's my conversation with North Alabama head coach Chris Willis. Coach, nothing about this college football season has been normal for anybody. This game will actually wrap up your four-game season. What has this year been like for you and this program? you gotta got to go all the way back. Uh, when we reported, I think it was July 6th, it was so much unknown. And we went over everything we could with the players. We laid it out there for them. Uh, they were all for, basically, at the end of the day, uh, hey, let's go play some football. Whether it's four games, five games, six games, they were excited about playing this fall. I think it's worked out. You know, I will tell you this, the four games with the bye weeks in between, it does make you feel like you're in an 11-12 game season because mm-hmm. like, you feel like you practice. I, I mean, well, this one thing we're doing, we're practicing. And I've had to scale back on how we do things, but it's dragging a little bit now. It's got that feel, uh, you know, and then when, you have, when you're 0-3 and you only play three games, now granted three of our opponents are FBS opponents, we've played a really stout schedule. It, that don't help matters. You know, if you could have squeezed a game out maybe against Southern Miss or Jacksonville State, I think the feeling would be a little different. With such a small sample size, and obviously the game's being sporadic, how difficult has it been for you and your coaching staff to actually evaluate what you have? I'll, I'll be honest with you, it, it's been tough. Um, you know, the hardest thing to do right now as, as a coach in, in this fall is it, just trying to keep everybody engaged. Uh, we go out, we have good practices, we got good leadership on this team, but, you know, we had uh, two weeks off going into BY, I mean, excuse me, going into Southern Miss. And so we're sitting here like, how do you navigate to a two by weeks here? I've never had that. And, you know, you work on yourself a lot. A lot of things what you do is almost like spring football during these times. You you do a lot of things, you evaluate the best you can in your practices. Using four games, uh, you know, yeah, we got some evaluating on that. We, we've seen some players that stepped up that, hey, you know, moving forward, they're going to be a big ass set for us but you know I, I would have liked to now that I look back at it I would have liked to maybe squeeze in six seven games and gone back to back to back but you know when we set this up we just didn't know how all this was going to play out and if you look across the country today obviously the COVID seems to be picking up you know and games are now postponing and canceling all over the yeah. country so uh, if we can just complete this game and get this game in we feel like we've accomplished what we set out and we've gotten better I mean we're playing some stiff competition obviously and we've better ourselves how do you approach a game like BYU when you face Liberty they weren't ranked yeah but now they are so as it turned out you faced one top 25 team now you're facing a top 10 team in BYU how how do you approach a game like this against the Cougars well this is a lot different uh than the previous three games I mean no disrespect to Liberty good football team and I I know Coach Freeze and them are doing a good job and they'll probably they could probably squeeze in the top 15 especially if they can beat NC State I think they got Coastal Carolina that'll be a big matchup Uh, that is if he's the head coach there by the time all that plays out we'll see you know and then we drop down to our level to play with FCS which is in our league is Jacksonville State's a really good opponent uh we match up against and then Southern Miss uh, I thought that was a game we let get away their FBS that we should have won that football game what we're about to play uh this coming Saturday it's just it's just different man it's there I don't see many weaknesses you know it's going to be intriguing to just keep up with you guys as y'all move forward because I you know I know that that y'all get a hard hit a little bit on on scheduling but just from what I see on film and, and, and studying the game of football like I do this is a very, very talented football team. I, I don't know where you guys rank it amongst all your great teams y'all had there, but it, to me, it's one of the best I've seen on film. It's night and day above any of the opponents we've done played. And uh, we're embracing the fact that we get to go out here and, and match up against a, a powerhouse team, but our players want to embrace the fact, too, that, hey, I want to put a gauge on myself. Let, you know, I, these are supposed to be the best in, in, in the world of FBS. Okay, well, I got recruited by FCS, but I felt like I could have maybe played at one of these Cool. So I'm sure my players want to, you know, it's like anything else. I know they're going up against a bigger opponent and, and, and a lot more 
you know, speed, but they want to be able to show those guys, hey, I can play with you. Effort-wise, I'm not worried about it for my team. I, I know we're going to go out and play hard, but, you know, th things have got to – you got to have some luck. Ball's got to bounce certain ways. Uh, you know, I just uh, – we're going to respect the opponent, that's for sure, because uh, they, they're good. They're a good football team. I, I know after we're done playing this game, uh, we're going to be rooting for you guys. I, I, just what we've seen on film, man, they're, they're, golly, they're a very talented football team. Coach, you've started two quarterbacks thus far, Deaver and Files. Where, where do things stand at quarterback heading into this game? Uh, fortunately for Rhett Files, it's been an up and down uh, fall. He got quarantined for two weeks. Uh, when we went into the Liberty game, he hadn't even practiced prior to that game. He'd been out for two weeks. And then my starting quarterback, Deaver, gets knocked out. And the poor kid had to play the whole game. He'd been out so out of rhythm. And I couldn't get mad at him. I mean, our quarterback, number one, I, a lot of people don't talk about this. We we did have a guy named Reed Herring who transferred from East Carolina. He was actually our number one quarterback who opted out before we got started. And so that kind of put us in a situation, our quarterback depth right now, we, we travel three, but number three hasn't even been on the field. And uh, so it's been a kind of a combination between Blake and Rhett. They're more of a drop back. They're, they're bigger bodies with strong arms. They're not really your type, typical RPO guys. So we've struggled a little bit because of that. But uh, and I've been proud of both of these kids. I mean, they, they come over and they, they put the work in and, and they bust their tail. We're going to have both of them for this game. Uh, I, I hope to try to play a little bit of both of them. I want to get them in and let them both get some action. Uh, it'll be Deaver that gets the start, and we'll kind of see how the game flows. The most important thing, and you talked about how you, you're not concerned about the effort of your team. Your team's going to bring it. That, that's something that you know about the guys you have. The most important thing for your team to be successful Saturday is what? Here's the thing. We, we know this, the opponent we're going up is superior. When you play a team like this, you're, you're kind of overmatched and outmanned. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to turn balls over. You don't want to lose the field position the entire game. I mean, if BYU is going to score 21, 28, 35, whatever it may be, well, let's make them work to do it. Let's just don't have, don't give it in a one play, you know, throw it up, touchdown, or a, a long run. Let's eliminate the big plays on defense. And then offensively, well, okay, maybe we don't hit the end zone once, or maybe we only hit it one time or two times. I don't, but whatever we do, let's just sustain some drives, use the clock a little bit, and and, and you know, do the best we can to take it one quarter at a time. Let's make it a game for the first quarter, then let's move to the second quarter. And then we'll kind of see how the game is flowing at that time and, and where we're at. And do I need to tell the officials, let's run that clock or not? <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> Coach, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate right. it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. That was Chris Willis, the head coach of North Alabama. He was great to talk to. I uh, really enjoyed that conversation. And uh, we're inching closer to his team, the North Alabama Lions, taking on the BYU Cougars from Lavelle Edwards Stadium. One more segment for me. When we come back, we'll check out some other top 25 action going on right now in college football. Final segment of Cougar Pregame Live presented by Mountain America Credit Union coming your way next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're tuned to Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now back to your host, Jason Shepard. All right, wrapping things up for Cougar Pregame Live. Checking out other top 25 action, a battle of two top 10 teams. Number three, Ohio State. Number nine, Indiana. Hoosiers kept this one close for about a quarter. Buckeyes now lead 35-14 in the third quarter, and there's still almost 11 minutes to go in the third, so the route is on for the Buckeyes. Number six, Florida, leading at Vanderbilt, 24-10. And Coastal Carolina, 15th in the country. They were trailing. They just took the lead 21-20 over Appalachian State, six and a half minutes to go in the third. Coming up next is the Zions Bank Cougar pregame coaches show. That comes your way next. You're listening to BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. It's time to preview today's matchup with head coach Kalani Sataki. It's the Cougar Pregame Coaches Show, presented by Zions Bank. For banking that helps you game plan for life, Zions Bank is for you. The Cougar Pregame Coaches Show is also brought to you by Mountain America Credit Union. Mountain America, guiding members forward for more than 80 years. Let's rejoin Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Good afternoon, Cougar football fans, and welcome inside Lavelle Edwards Stadium on the BYU campus in Provo, Utah, for a Saturday matinee featuring the eighth-ranked BYU Cougars and the Lions of North Alabama. 
BYU's annual FCS game being played on a cool but spectacularly sunny day. And the prospects for BYU have rarely been sunnier. Headed for 9-0 with the possibility of a 10-0 campaign and a New Year's Six Bowl bid squarely in the sights. I'm your play-by-play commentator, Greg Rubel. With me is the slinging, scrambling southpaw himself, the former BYU quarterback, Riley Nelson. And Riley, it's been 15 days since the Cougars last played a game. And in that time, dozens of games have been canceled or postponed coast-to-coast. And for many teams, the number of chances to make an impression is dwindling. So these days, every game is a good game. Because I'm not sure how many programs will actually be able to say they got to 10 games this season. Today's another opportunity, another data point, and another chance to play your best game of the season. Yes, the opponent is overmatched, but BYU's effort level should be unmatched. Observers are still watching keenly, Riles, to see how the Cougars play today. Most definitely they are. You know what, uh, a parallel that I draw between this is all those years in, well, in normal circumstances, right? You check in, Alabama would schedule some cupcake, right? Some blowout. Often they do it before the Auburn, you know, before the Iron Bowl or Auburn or against Georgia, before some big game, get their guys a rest. But I would always still check in on those games just to be like, is Alabama in shape? Have they stayed sharp? Are they on their game? Same thing here for BYU. And I, honestly, I'm kind of giddy the fact that we're in that situation. They've been so dominant. They've been so good. People are still going to check in to be like, hey, did BYU handle their business? Oh, it was 50-something to a little. Yeah, they did. All right. And they look forward to the next game. Well, after losing uh, Jackson McChesney in the season opener, uh, BYU enjoyed pretty good health in the backfield until the Boise State game when Lopini Katoa suffered an ankle injury that will keep him sidelined today. The hope is he'll be well enough to play against San Diego State. But today, it'll be Tyler Algier, Sione Finau, Kavika Fonua, and Miles Davis given the bulk of the ball-carrying responsibilities. We'll hear Kalani Sitake about that and the rest of the game plan for today when we come back after this. You're listening to the Zions Bank Cougar Pregame Coaches Show for banking that helps you game plan for life. Zions Bank is for you. Kalani's pregame interview is next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. The Cougar Pregame Coaches Show continues once again. Here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Coming to you from Lavelle Edwards Stadium, where today 8-0 and 8th-ranked BYU hosts 0-3 North Alabama. First ever meeting between these two programs. 15th all-time game for BYU against an FCS foe. BYU 14-0 in the previous lower division games, a winning by an average margin of 38 points. The undefeated Cougs are today favored by roughly 48 points. BYU fans, this reminder... That when the Cougars win, you win with Papa John's Pizza. With a win today, a BYU win. Pizza will be 50% off at PapaJohns.com using the online promo code BYU50 Monday only. That's BYU50, the promo code, but on Monday only. This offer good at any Utah Papa John's location. Well, BYU today, coming off a of bye week and uh, facing an underdog opponent. So there's an expectation of dominance here today. And in our pregame conversation, I asked head coach Kalani Sitake what it will take for the Cougars to be as good as they're expected to be against North Alabama. You've heard me mention being at our best, and that's the key, but uh, I think it's also understanding the the level of being as efficient as possible in all three phases. And so looking at the game plan that that, that you see from North Alabama, they they, uh, slow the game down quite often, and we saw that from a little bit from UTSA. And so they'll slow the game down and, and... uh, that's why the importance of, of taking care of the football, uh, getting out of drives on defense, getting stops on third downs, um, creating big plays and possibly turnovers is going to be huge for us because with a limited amount of reps that we're going to see, I mean, that's what we're anticipating. And they've done that in, the, in the, their games against uh, FBS opponents like Southern Miss and Liberty. And so with that being said, we're going to have to be able to score uh, and and and. and use every play effectively, you know, and, and that's where uh, little mistakes could really cost you. So in all three phases, we need to see a higher level of discipline and a high level of efficiency. And if we can do that, I, I feel really good. That, that's, that's kind of the mindset and the focus that we've had going into this, this game. What does it say to you that North Alabama has already played two FBS teams and neither of them got more than 28 points against this Lions defense? 
it shows that they actually have been using this game plan and had experience doing it before, and that's why we anticipate seeing it uh, today. You know, and I think for us is being able to um, know that and plan accordingly, and we've done that so far, and and then making sure we execute our game plan, and that's. Uh, uh, you, you want everything to go perfectly, but you know some adversity that happens in certain times. But hopefully we can create more havoc that we can have to react to things. And that's going to be the key is us setting the uh, the tempo, setting the, uh, uh, you know, making our, our, our presence known and have, kind of controlling the game ourselves rather than reacting to them, trying to do what they did. And I think they were able to control most of the games in, in the Liberty and Southern Miss game and even Jacksonville State being able to, uh, limit the reps and maybe even cause a little bit of frustration you know for us as being patient and knowing that we're going to have our moments and then uh, when we have these spurts of big making big plays uh, making sure that we capitalize on it and just keep it rolling so is disruption the foundation of the defensive game plan then it, it has to be yes and then there's a there's a there's a level of uh, risks that are involved and and I think that's kind of what you have to do though otherwise this game we had to do something to disrupt their timing and I don't think the other teams have done that enough when in, in them and, and listen they're 0 three but if you look at it they they were able to stay close in those games and even have the lead against Southern Miss and so um but they haven't they gave up 28 points to, to Liberty 24 to Jacksonville State and 24 to Southern Miss and that's uh they feel like they can stay in games that way obviously we have to score more points and if we can limit their opportunities and their and their their points on the scoreboard, then we'll be good. And not only a lead against Southern Miss, but a, a fourth quarter lead. Well, yeah, we went deep into the game and 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 uh, seven zero at halftime against Liberty. So uh, we we've recognized their abilities. We recognize how good they are. We respect our opponents. At the same time, we need to make sure that we establish our our identity and do our part in this game. I'm sure you've seen they haven't allowed a first quarter point yet in their three games, so teams aren't really coming out of the gate strong against them on offense. How would you describe the offensive game plan? Yeah, offensive game plan is going to be, I mean, they, they take some risks and they crowd the box a little bit, so I think they're going to try to control the run game. Um, and then, um, you know, they'll, they'll do, they have some, they'll challenge us in, in coverage. So uh, we'll have to take advantage of some of our plays and break tackles and get on our blocks up front. And if we keep our game plan going, I, I think that, uh, it, we match up well against them, but it's just going to be a matter of what they give us. If, if you know, they're going to, they're going to, if they're going to pressure, we have to make them pay. If they're not going to, we have to make them pay, and it's us being able to react on it. And I feel comfortable with Zach and the boys um, seeing the things that we're going to we're going to get from them from North Alabama. Do you get anybody back today? And if you don't have Lopini Katoa, uh, how do you plan to go in the backfield? Yeah, we're going to hold Lopini out. I mean, that, I think that's important that he he he's uh, heals up and, and is 100 percent, but. Tyler Algier, we'll have a mix of Tyler Algier, Sione Finau, Kaviko Fanua will play some running back as well as uh, as our, our our on defense. And then uh, Miles Davis, those guys, will they've, they've had some great practices, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing them on the field. How close is uh, Zane Anderson? Zane, Zane uh, should play today, and, and we'll see how much. It, it's, uh, he's, he's definitely not 100% yet, but he practiced every, week, every day uh, this week. And um, it's just a matter of, you know, in game, game time, seeing if he's going to feel comfortable um, getting on the field, making plays. If he, there's any hesitancy, then we'll pull him out. Tyler Batty's missed some time. Uh, where's he at? Yeah, and we're, we're decided that this game plan, we're probably going to um, slow down on Tyler Batty as well. We, we had high hopes of him practicing this week, and he did. And, and, uh, but I think the, the wise thing to do is for us to – uh, he wants to get back on the field, but we, we really have to be smart with his progression because he's only a, a young freshman. He's got a, a big future ahead of, of of himself here, and he's going to make a lot of plays for us. And I think uh, timing is everything and then being smart in the way that we get him on the field and have him make plays. You had a break earlier in the year in September after the Army situation, but it's been a while since you've had any time off. Has it stoked the fires to, to get back out there for these guys and get playing again? Yeah, we saw it in, in, in uh, Monday's practice, the guys getting after each other. I mean, you, you saw this, this, uh, this hunger to get back on the field. And so it was nice. To, I think the guys have mentioned it before. It was, it was a good little break. I uh, can't complain about that. We took advantage of it. And, and, but now uh, through this week's competition, I see the same team that's been there from the Boise State prep to now, and then and, and looking forward to having the same type of results. Well, in late November, in the Wasatch Front, you never know what you're going to get weather-wise, but we're going to get uh, looks like a sunny afternoon for football, a great way to head down the stretch run. 
Yeah, a little old school uh, daytime game. Looking forward to it. And, and uh, you know, going to have a lot of fun at Lavelle Elder Stadium. Well, Kalani, thank you for the pregame talk. Uh, best of luck against North Alabama. And we'll talk to you in the postgame. Appreciate it, Greg. Let's go. That is BYU head coach Kalani Sitake leading us into the homey home field advantage for today. Brought to you by Homie, who reminds you that there's no place like home playing in front of Cougar fans who have your back. Homie's got your back, saving you sweet cash when buying or selling a home. Call it your homey home field advantage. And today, BYU's going after an eighth consecutive home win, extending the longest home win streak of the Kalani Sitake era. It would, and it would be the first eight-game home win streak since the 2014 and 15 seasons. This has been the Zions Bank Cougar Pregame Coaches Show. For banking that helps you game plan for life, Zions Bank is for you. And this is BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Kickoff is just around the corner. You're tuned to the BYU Store Cougar Kickoff Show. The BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. The Cougar Kickoff Show is also brought to you by Bailey's Moving. We move with you every step of the way since 1952. BYU Dining, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. And by Utah Community Credit Union. Get more house, same payment at UCCU. It's what we do. Let's head live to the Mo Betta's broadcast booth. Alongside Riley Nelson, here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Hello and good afternoon once again, Cougar Nation. Welcome back inside Lovell Edwards Stadium on the Brigham Young University campus in Provo, Utah. This is the Cougar Kickoff Show brought to you by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. And today, BYU looks to go 9-0 as the Cougars entertain the Lions of North Alabama, UNA, and it's a third year of a four-year transition to full FCS status. This program won multiple national titles as a D2 program, but it's only the fourth time all-time that North Alabama has faced an FBS program since the 1A-1AA split in 1978, and three of those four meetings have taken place this season, a season that will feature only a four dates of play for UNA. Greg Rubel and Riley Nelson once again with you here in the broadcast booth joined by engineer Michael Wimmer, statistician Ralph Sokolowski and spotter Tyler Gibb, former BYU wide receiver Mike Mitchell Jurgens, reporting from the Zions Bank end zone for banking that helps you game plan for life. Zions Bank is for you. Our team in the BYU radio studios is host Jason Shepard, engineers Barry Squires and Sean Fay, coordinating producer Terry South, control board operator Liam Howard and broadcast intern Andrew Gray. You're listening to us on the new skin, BYU Sports Network, our satellite flagship, BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143 and 89.1 FM HD2. Our Salt Lake City flagship is KSL News Radio, 102.7 FM and 1160 AM. We are also heard on network affiliates around the world on BYU Radio's apps, the BYU Cougars app, and the BYU Game Day app, as well as the KSL app. You can also get us on byuradio.org and byucougars.com, and you can get the archives, the highlights on the BYU Football Podcast and also at byuradio.org. So lots of ways to tune in. However you are joining us today, it is great. Wonderful to have you with us. Well, BYU's last outing was a resounding 51-17 win at Boise State. Uh, The Broncos' worst home loss since their first season as an FBS member 24 years ago. And the game was only that close because of uh, two defensive breakdowns resulting in a pair of long, late touchdown tosses. The final margin probably uh, should have been even greater than it was. But regardless, it was an impressive, impressive result. Today's result is already a foregone conclusion. So, Riley, the question becomes... What is an outcome befitting a top 10 FBS program against a winless FCS program? You got to get in the 50s offensively and maximum two scores. I wouldn't even say two touchdowns. You can get maybe get away with a 10-point result from the defense. I'm hoping they pitch their first shutout. I think a team that's this good deserves to have a goose egg in the, in the points against category at some point in their schedule, and I hope that's on the minds of these defensive players tonight. We just heard Kalani in your interview with him talk about how North Alabama's strategy is going to be to come out, slow the game down, limit possessions, so getting up above that 50 is actually going to require a challenge in and of itself 
to BYU's going to have to execute because North Alabama is going to come out from the get-go trying to shorten this game and, and limit BYU's opportunities. So that's something that I'm going to be looking forward to. For the record, uh, BYU's last shutout came six years and one day ago today, 64 nothing over a winless FCS team in Savannah State. Uh, more of the BYU Store. Cougar kickoff show is straight ahead after we tell you that this season, BYU football and Mountain America Credit Union are changing lives. For each field goal BYU makes, Mountain America will donate $250 to the American Red Cross to help fund humanitarian services and programs. Our pregame look ahead to BYU and North Alabama continues from Lavelle Edwards Stadium after this short break. On the new skin, BYU Sports Network. The Cougar Kickoff Show continues. Let's head back to the Mo Betta's broadcast booth with Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Second to last home game for the BYU Cougars today, the eighth-ranked Cougs taking on North Alabama. The Lions have played in Utah once before, just two years ago. It was a win at Southern Utah in Cedar City during the Lions' first season as a transitional FCS member. Today's game represents the sixth longest trip that UNA has taken to play a football game. Today's game is the last one BYU will play before the first college football playoff selection committee rankings are released on Tuesday. And playing FCS teams won't really move the needle, but that's not to say that today's outcome will have no bearing. If BYU struggles in any way against 0-3 UNA, it'll be noted. Now, I'm not saying BYU should abandon sportsmanship, but I want to see a BYU team on the throttle on both sides of the ball until a message has been clearly sent. That means scoring on every possession, certainly as long as Zach Wilson is in the game. And Riley, if you, if you can hold Boise State to three points through three quarters, you should be able to hold North Alabama maybe to zero points through at least three quarters. I'm not going to say that a high-scoring shutout is the only acceptable result, but it would help send a message to the selection committee as they ponder their Tuesday rankings about what this team's capable of. I think you're right on, Greg. I think that hopefully these are things that have been talked about. I don't get the luxury of any more being in the locker rooms, but if if I would have been a leader or an upperclassman on this team, my message would have been, all right, guys, we're going to get two quarters, starters, right? We're going to get two quarters. Minimum acceptable is 42. Like, we're going to get maybe three possessions first quarter, three possessions second. We should expect to score touchdowns on all of them. And then it said it would be, hey, young guys, when you get in, same expectation applies. We are so much better than them. Our twos, our threes should be able to move the ball and put it in the end zone. Likewise, on defense, hey, do your assignment, play with great effort. This is an offense that's been struggling all year. Let's not be the one in their last game and in a game where everyone's going to be scrutinizing us most closely to give up garbage points and garbage touchdowns due to lack of concentration or lack of effort. Fantastic. Time now for tonight's and today's Hyatt Place Comfort Zone feature at Hyatt Place Provo. Your safety and comfort will always be our highest priority. And BYU is very comfortable in the month of November. Under Kalani Sitake, BYU's 13-5 in November games and 20-6 in its last 26 November games overall. This season, BYU will play two November games. The Cougars already won at Boise State and are today expected to walk away with a win over North Alabama. After today, just one regular season game remains on the current schedule, December 12th, home to San Diego State. Barring, of course, any additional games sliding into open dates, we would now say the more likely ones would be December 5th and December 19th because November 28th is next Saturday and I just don't know that's going to come together at this late date. We're back with more of the BYU Store Cougar Kickoff Show right after this on the new skin BYU Sports Network. Getting you geared up for game time. This is the Cougar Kickoff Show. Now back to Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. BYU and North Alabama kicking it just after the top of the hour here at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. No Lopini Katoa in the backfield. No Bracken El Bakri or Tyler Batty on the D-line. No Joe Tukuafu on the O-line. Zane Anderson, though, is expected back in the defensive secondary. Even without El Bakri and Batty, BYU should have more than enough to up front to handle and manhandle, really. A North Alabama team averaging less than two yards per carry 
and fewer than 50 rushing yards per game. Riley, BYU has one of the best run defenses in the FBS, and here comes an FCS team struggling to get much going on the ground. BYU can afford to maybe take some risks and ramp up the disruption level today. This should be an active day in the backfield for Cougar defenders. UNA's turned it over five times in three games, but I'm expecting maybe multiple takeaways by BYU today. Yeah, UNA does not give themselves much opportunity to they play a complete style that is all about risk mitigation right like don't let's not screw it up but in their path to trying to accomplish you know not taking any risk or putting any kind of uh, opportunity to give the ball away out there they also accomplish very little they just don't move the ball much BYU is so much better in this particular matchup that that shouldn't matter whether North Alabama plays as conservatively as possible Talent-wise, personnel-wise, and scheme-wise, BYU is good enough to create all sorts of chaos and havoc, and I think your expectation is one that this uh, BYU defense will meet today, producing multiple turnovers, and I would hope a big player too defensively on special teams. We'll see if the Cougars can maybe even score on defense. Uh, when that happens, that's a, it's an invariable sign of victory, a victory that is all but assured before the game kicks off. That is the way it goes when FCS plays at FBS. In fact, this season... Uh, in this shortened season for college football generally, there have been 30 games that have seen FCS take on FBS, and the FCS teams are 1-29. and 29. The one win was Jacksonville State over FIU. Jacksonville State also, by the way, beat North Alabama this season as well. All right, uh, coming up, we'll head down to field level and hear from Mitchell Juergens as the BYU Store Cougar kickoff show continues live from Lavelle Edwards Stadium on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. <laughs> This is the Cougar Kickoff Show. Let's get back to Riley Nelson and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. BYU in North Alabama coming up here at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. BYU on its way to 9-0 and seeking an eighth straight home win. The Cougars come into today as the only FBS team ranked in the top ten in total offense, total defense, scoring offense, and scoring defense. Truly, that's a well-rounded team and as well-rounded a team as we've seen here at BYU. No one part of the team is having to carry another, and when needed, the kickers doing their jobs at a high level too. Jake Oldroyd is yet to miss a field goal, and Ryan Rico has been very reliable in the punt game. Return productivity kind of inconsequential but coverage has been exceptional. Riley, you have to look pretty hard to find areas needing improvement if there is any fine-tuning to be done. Where are you looking? You mentioned the kicking game. Blocked extra point, then a missed extra point. Now, I don't expect that to continue, but kicking game is just as much mental as it is physical. Hopefully we don't get the yips on the extra point. A very, But you mentioned looking hard. That's a very small point to look at. Second for me is on the defense. Their quarterback's not ultra-athletic, but if he is going to run around, I felt like they could have done a better job containing Boise's backup once he got in the game. That was the only chance he had at success. Look for them to do better and improve on that here tonight. Before, today. before we hear from Mitchell Juergens, let's hear our national anthem. At the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly. Head down now to field level and former BYU wide receiver Mitchell Jurgens. Mitch reporting from the Zions Bank end zone for banking that helps you game plan for life. Zions Bank is for you. And Mitch, we know that North Alabama will try to slow the game down. And we also know they haven't allowed a single score in the first quarter this season. We're minutes away from the coin toss. And we know BYU always, always defers if they win. If they win today, the coin toss, 
I say take the ball. Get a score on the board early because we know the Cougars have been excellent front runners. Yeah, Greg, I agree. You know, I, I say take the ball if the Cougs win the toss to get on board early. Um, but I'm not so much worried about how good North Alabama has been in the first quarter as the reason to do that. Um, for me, you know, the hope is these starters can take a significant rest in the second half. And I, I want to see the ball in Zach Wilson's hands as much as possible. And if they defer in the first half, you know, that's one less drive to impress those Heisman voters. Um, so regardless of who gets the ball first, though, they need to pick up right where they left off last week against Boise with some time off. It's not an excuse to come out rusty or stiff. Uh, and it would only be fitting to see the Cougs come out very strong strong early in this game and put up at least another high 40 point performance if not 50. Mitchell thank you coming up next Riley Nelson's keys to this game the coin toss and the opening kick this has been the BYU store Cougar kickoff show live from Lavelle Edwards Stadium on the new skin BYU Sports Network.